On Nationwide this evening, it was the defining battle which shaped the course of Europe's history and set the tone for French and European democracy, which has lasted to this day. Guest presenter Sean Whelan finds out all about the Irish man who led the victors at the Battle of Waterloo, and we hear about the thousands of Irish who fought and died in that battle of 200 years ago. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Nationwide, where we're in search of the Irish at the Battle of Waterloo. It was the battle of Europe, the battle for Europe, the battle that changed the fate of a continent. And thousands of Irish soldiers took part, playing crucial roles throughout this epic event. It was a huge, um, heroic, stubborn defence and a marvellous display of courage. Tonight we meet some of the people who are helping to rediscover the reality of Ireland's major role in the Waterloo campaign and puncture some of the myths about the winning general, the Duke of Wellington. He never actually said that line about being born in a stable. So come with us as we discover more about the Irish involvement in this legendary battle. After all, there's got to be a reason why the tallest obelisk in Europe is here in Dublin. Like uh, every other kid in this city, I played on this monument, and like every other kid, I got stuck up there, had to be rescued by my father. These steps are incredibly steep. So it was always amongst my earliest memories, the monument. But I never really gave much thought to why it's here, who it's to. Yeah, sure, the Duke of Wellington and Waterloo, it says so on the sides. But why? Why here? What's the connections to Ireland? Well, as it turns out, there's loads of connections to Ireland. During the Napoleonic Wars, the Irish joined the British Army in huge numbers. At least one-third of the army's strength came from this island. Research shows Irish recruits came from every county, at an average age of 26, and were mostly Catholics. There was no conscription, but your economic prospects were a key factor in whether you joined up or not. There's a variety of occupations present, but one thing that you do tend to see again and again and again is the word labour. These are people who don't necessarily have a sort of a stable, recognised skill. They don't have a trade of their own. So certainly that would suggest that in a lot of these cases, there is an economic motivation for enlistment. It has to be there. And even though officers were mostly from the landlord class, like Colonel John Millet Hamerton of Tipperary, economics too played a big role in their choice of career. For many Anglo-Irish officers and sons of big families, it's the same for them. If you're the eldest son, you, you'll get access to the estate. But if you're the second, third or fourth son, um, your family would be very keen for you to go uh, into the empire, uh, become a civil servant or more commonly join up into a British regiment, but purchase your way into a junior rank in a regiment. Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, was typical of this caste. He was born in Dublin, across the road from government buildings in this house on Marion Street. His family had been in Ireland since Norman times. His father, a Meath landlord, was the first professor of music in Trinity College. His wife was Irish, Kitty Packenham, Lord Longford's daughter. He worked in the Irish government in Dublin and assembled his army in Cork. So why isn't he regarded as an Irish hero? I think everyone knows the famous quote about just because a man is born in a stable it doesn't make him a horse. And I think that line, more than anything else, has damaged Wellington's reputation in Ireland. He's seen as having rejected the country of his birth, so as a result Irish people have been quite happy to reject him. The great irony though is that he never actually said that line. It was a joke that Daniel O'Connell told in 1843 at one of the monster meetings and the joke proved po so popular that it soon became attributed to Wellington himself. But it did create a certain amount of resentment that this was a man who, despite being born in Ireland and having had a career in Ireland, had turned his back on his country. And I think for that reason, Waterloo isn't really celebrated as an Irish victory, even though the lead general was Irish and even though so many of the soldiers was Irish. Wellington's worldwide fame today stems from his victory over Napoleon Bonaparte at Waterloo, itself a term that has entered the language for final defeat or downfall, and is the subject of countless books, plays, movies and pop songs. But there's another specifically Irish link between the two men, and it's kept in the National Library, an Irish eyewitness's account of Napoleon's escape from Elba, the event that led directly to the Battle of Waterloo. 
and here it is, a letter from James Grattan, son of a famous political family here in Ireland, to his friend Colonel Fitzgerald, and he's writing, I am just returned from Elba with the account of the escape of Napoleon. Now, young Grattan had been a soldier, an officer during the war, had been touring Italy after his service had finished, and decided to just rock up to Elba and chance his arm and see if he could get an interview with the most famous man in the world. And he's writing here of being stopped by a guard on the island, asking him what he wanted. And he said, Grattan said, I want to speak to Napoleon. And the guard told him to come back the next morning. Well, he got much more than he bargained for because Napoleon was in the act of escaping. He had a thousand soldiers that turned up to help him do so. And Napoleon had ordered that young Grattan be locked up on the island for four days so that he could get a head start on them before the news leaked out. The news that we have here in this very document in the National Library. James Grattan was the eldest son of Henry Grattan, the leader of the Patriot Party in the Irish Parliament. And one of the members of Grattan's Parliament had been young Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington. So two of the great commanders at Waterloo were linked through an Irish political family. Waterloo was the only time Napoleon and Wellington faced each other in battle, a battle that decided the fate of Europe in a single day, and was, by Wellington's own admission, a close-run thing, with horrendous casualties from a full day of close-quarters fighting. But to get an overview of how the battle worked, I went to McCroom in County Cork, where the Prince August Toy Soldier Factory has installed this humongous model. All right, pay attention, this is how the Battle of Waterloo works. Down here is the French army led by Napoleon. They're attacking up this road which leads to Brussels. Wellington has laid his army out to block them along a ridge line in the countryside here. His plan is to defend the line here, stop the French from breaking through and hold out for as long as he can to give this army over here, the Prussians, a chance to cross the countryside and join up with him. The Prussian army plus Wellington's army have enough troops to defeat Napoleon. Napoleon's plan is to smash through this Allied line as quickly as he can before the Prussians arrive because he knows that they're on their way. So he's going to attack the very middle of Wellington's line. And right here in the middle of the middle is where the Enniskillen Regiment are. That's them moving into position. Key to Wellington's plan to defend this line are farmhouses like this one. This one's right in the middle of the line, but there are two others on either end, and they are forcing the French to attack into this area. Of particular importance to our story is a farmhouse that's over here. It's not actually in the model yet. It's a place called Hugomont. Hugomont was the first place the French attacked, and they surprised the defenders by bursting in through an unlocked gate at the rear. Ten British soldiers, three of them from Ireland, battled through and managed to close the gates on the French, saving the strong point and possibly the entire battle. I went to Hugomont with Waterloo expert Lieutenant Colonel Dan Harvey, who told me more about the Irish involved in this key episode. Of the ten people, three were Irish. Two brothers from Clonus County Monaghan, James and Joseph Graham, and one uh, lieutenant from County Wexford, uh, James Harvey. Any relation? A very close uh, connection. Um, only found out about it a number of weeks ago and in serious pursuit of it. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if it is established. But it was Corporal James Graham of Clonus and the Coldstream Guards who was to become famous, singled out by Wellington as the bravest of the brave at Waterloo for his actions here. This was one of three acts that were conspicuous and gallant in the course of the battle here. The first, of course, being part of, of that party that closed the gate. And then his own brother, Joseph, who was wounded and was placed in a barn which had caught fire. And he uh, managed to ask permission to uh, stop uh, his engagement with the uh, French and go and save his brother and pull him clear from the burning embers. This he did, and he returned to take up the defence. Uh, and in doing that, uh, he spotted a French man who was about to kill a English captain and instead killed him. So for three reasons, he became 
uh, noteworthy and worthy of mention. Although there were Irish in every unit of the British Army at Waterloo, there were three specifically Irish units involved in the battle. Two were cavalry units, the Enniskillen Dragoons and the 18th Hussars, nicknamed the Drogheda Cossacks. But it was the Enniskillen Infantry Unit, the 27th, that became the most famous Irish unit because of Waterloo. More than 90% of its men came from Ireland, with every county represented on its rolls. At Waterloo, the Enniskillens made one of the most famous stands in British military history, holding the centre of Wellington's line against the full onslaught of Napoleon's troops, but paying a terrible price, losing two-thirds of its men. There were three battalions of the 27th. They understood what Wellington was doing. They understood what needed to be done. They were soldiers, and they were soldiers to their very soul. They knew that they couldn't break. They knew that if they broke, that was it, the centre of the line was gone. Napoleon said that he had seen Prussian bravery, he had seen French bravery, but he had never seen anything like the bravery of the soldiers that had castles in their caps. And they were the Inniskillings. They were the Irish at Waterloo. Coming up in part two, we'll be looking at what happened to the Irish at Waterloo after the fighting was over. Welcome back to Nationwide. We're in Belgium on the battlefield of Waterloo. The ferocious battle fought here 200 years ago pitted the allied nations of Europe against the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. It was an all or nothing gamble with neither side willing to back down. In a tightly packed battlefield, which some say was little bigger than New York Central Park, 180,000 men, 35,000 horses and 500 cannons fought at close quarters. And the casualties were horrendous. Some 20,000 died that day. This monument to German soldiers is on what used to be a large sand pit. It's not a sand pit now. It was an obvious grave for the casualties um, at Waterloo. And there's up to 6,000 buried where we're standing now. For about eight to ten days afterwards, locals were employed to bury the, um, the dead. Those that weren't buried ended up being burnt. The highest ranked Irish casualty of Waterloo was Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of British Heavy Cavalry. He was killed by Polish Lancers. His family built a tower on their estate in Tipperary to commemorate him. He was one of three Irish generals in Wellington's army at Waterloo. When the Napoleonic Wars ended, the men who fought in them went off in all directions. Some came back here to Ireland, others emigrated abroad. Some stayed in the military, others went back to civilian professions. Some of them prospered in life, others ended in dreadful poverty, including a few officers from the landlord class. The oldest surviving British veteran of the Battle of Waterloo was a Kerry man, Morris Walsh. He died in 1892 at the age of 97. 1892, that's when Liverpool Football Club was founded. It's that recent, and he must have seen an enormous amount of change in his lifetime. But for other veterans of the Battle of Waterloo, well, they ended their days in the comparative luxury of this place, the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham. Paul O'Brien of the Office of Public Works helps to look after this incredible historic building, which is older than its better-known sister institution, the Chelsea Pensioners Hospital. It was very luxurious. Uh, the building was built between 1680 and 1684. And the first pensioners came in in 1684. Uh, they were well looked after. They would have had medical facilities here. They were fed three times a day. And they also had a beer ration of three pints a day as well. It was to Kilmainham that James Graham, the hero of Hugomont, retired after his military service. He retired here in 1830, uh, where he was actually told that he was suffering from a chest injury, and also on his papers it said that he was worn out. Uh, he probably started off as an out pensioner and then came in as an in pensioner and lived here between 1840 and 1845. 
And when he died, he died here in the hospital, didn't he? He did indeed, and he was buried in the pensioner's graveyard, uh, which is adjacent to Bully's Acre, which is the oldest cemetery in Dublin City, within the grounds of the Royal Hospital here in Kilmainham. But such was his fame during his lifetime that James Graham had his portrait painted. I've come to the National Gallery with Peter Malloy, who came across the portrait in his research, but has never actually seen it. Few have, as it's been in storage for decades. So here he comes. For the first time. There he is. Perfect display. Here he is. Corporal Graham now with an extra stripe, of course. That's an yeah. Irish hero of Waterloo in real life. So he's resplendent in full uniform there. And he has the Waterloo medal on his left breast. And for a guy like this, I mean, of Clonus County Monaghan to be here in the National Gallery. An ordinary Irish man, yeah, a ranking soldier. It's absolutely unprecedented. This just does not happen for an ordinary soldier of the British Army during this period, Irish or otherwise. They just don't receive this kind of attention. So it really is an indication of the fame that Graham's exploits of Waterloo were in him and the sort of lasting legacy it has for him. But I learned there was another, smaller picture of the hero of Ugomont, and it's kept here in Clonus County Monaghan by the Coulsons, the direct descendants of Sergeant Graham. As time passes by, we realise just how it was extraordinary, I think, and his role that he played in uh, the closing of the gates at Jugamont. George, tell us about the relationship, the, the, the line to Sergeant Graham, uh, the, the hero of Waterloo. Take us through the generations. Well, this here is a picture of my father, and it was his father's uncle was Sergeant James Graham. What do you remember of the, the stories being told in the family when you were growing up about Sergeant Graham? Our parents told us about it, but because I say I wasn't that interested in history. So uh, uh, I'm sorry now I didn't listen to more of it at the time. So you're having to catch up a bit now? Yeah, I'm catching up now. Nearly when it's too late. <laughs> While most veterans led ordinary lives after Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington went on to an extraordinary life. A giant figure of the British Empire, he became Prime Minister in 1828. And it was Wellington as Prime Minister who brought in Catholic emancipation in the teeth of opposition from his own Tory party and the King. It's interesting that Wellington gets no credit for Catholic emancipation, even though he was the Prime Minister who brought in emancipation, and even though he was the Prime Minister who fought a duel in 1829 against another member of the House of Lords who thought that Wellington had betrayed the ascendancy and betrayed the state and all of these values. I think it's because he was forced to concede emancipation grudgingly, but O'Connell's election in County Clare, that changed everything because now suddenly it looked like there would be civil war in Ireland if, if emancipation wasn't granted. And Wellington was forced to go to the king and say, look, I defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. I could defeat O'Connell and the Irish if they rose up in open rebellion. That wouldn't be any trouble. But I can't defeat this because it's a peaceful mass mobilization and we can't just shoot unarmed innocent people. So we have to back down. Daniel O'Connell pushed Catholic emancipation to the top of the political agenda, but he had nothing but scorn for the Prime Minister who delivered the change in the law, and the feeling was mutual. I think it'd be fair to say that Wellington and O'Connell hated each other. They didn't trust each other. They both saw the other person as an enemy of the state, a troublemaker, someone who really couldn't be trusted. And even throughout the campaign for emancipation, O'Connell was the one saying that Wellington, the Prime Minister, was the enemy. He kept referring to Waterloo. He kept reminding his listeners that Irish people, Irish men, had fought at Waterloo, but they had not been rewarded afterwards. They had been let down by successive British governments. And he kept reminding them that it had been Irish heroism, Irish blood, that had won that great victory. Not, Water not Wellington. 
He dismissed Wellington as a stunted corporal, a chance victor of a battle, uh, someone who really should not have won at Waterloo. Wellington, for his part, saw that O'Connell was a, thought he was a scoundrel, someone who was dishonest, someone who couldn't be trusted. And throughout the 1820s, 1830s and the 1840s, he thought there needed to be a strong military presence in Ireland to keep an eye on O'Connell. So the Napoleonic era that climaxed at Waterloo was hugely important in Irish history. So why isn't this a more prominent part of the Irish story? Why has memory of Waterloo and Wellington faded so much? The biggest reason, and the unavoidable one of course, is the fact that Irish involvement at Waterloo is inextricably bound up with Ireland's position at the time as part of the Union, as part of the British Empire. It's very much part of the British heritage in Ireland. And that's something that doesn't cause many problems for the 19th century. It doesn't really affect how Irish people see it and how Irish people view it. As you start to get into the 20th century though, as you start to see these competing narratives of nationalism and ultimately of course independence in the case of Southern Ireland, it becomes increasingly difficult to square those two stories and to square those two strands of Irish experience. And I think ultimately the, the Waterloo element and the British element of things begins to slip away a little bit. The centenary of Waterloo was not marked at all. Europe was once again embroiled in war. But this year's bicentenary is being commemorated with some large-scale events. At Enniskillen Castle a fortnight ago, a group of historical reenactors from all over Ireland came together to commemorate the stand of the Enniskillen Regiment and their unbreakable square at Waterloo. On their caps, the same badge with its depiction of Enniskillen Castle that so impressed Napoleon. For the reenactors, it was a last chance to drill in Ireland before heading over to Belgium to take part in a huge reenactment that will take place at Waterloo over the next few days. We, we are part of a big organisation called Big Battalions and that has been organising the very small little units from all over the world into uh, larger brigades and divisions just for this event. And then we have 5,000 people on the battlefield, 300 horses with cavalry and 100 cannons uh, blasting away at us as well. So it's going to be quite a spectacle. Over in Waterloo, the authorities have built a temporary stadium to accommodate thousands of spectators who are going to watch this lavish reconstruction of the battle. It's going to be along this ridge line that most of the spectators will be seated. But of course, if you can't actually make it to Waterloo, there's always this model down in McCroom to see. The Napoleonic Wars, which ended at Waterloo, left an enormous impact on Ireland. And there are still plenty of physical reminders all over this island of a series of epic events in European, indeed global history, that Ireland and the Irish were right in the middle of. And that's well worth remembering.